Hi, this is Gannon Baker, and you're listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast. Hey, Hoop Heads. Wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user-friendly machines on the market, and they truly accelerate skill development faster than ever. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com and follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Mention the Hoop Heads podcast and save an extra $300 on the Dr. Dish Rebel, All-Star, and CT models. Also, make sure to check out the new Dr. Dish Home Machine, which is perfect for these crazy times when gyms and schools are closed. Visit drdishbasketball.com for details. That's a great deal, Hoop Heads. Get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. It's a program that's for students to foster that positive development and, and their well-being, but challenging them and, and helping them acquire the right set of skills and experiences and, and relationships that enables them to develop into successful and contributing adults to our society. Mihai Raducanu is the president and CEO of his own basketball training business, No Limit Performance, and also works with Gannon Baker as his director of business development. Mihai teaches two graduate-level classes as a university adjunct professor at Canisius College, as well as being an inspirational and educational speaker. Mihai earned a business marketing and a business management degree from Coastal Carolina University, where he was an NCAA Division I basketball player. He also holds a master's degree from Canisius College in sports administration. Mihai grew up in Romania. He moved to Canada at age 15 and played his high school basketball at Cathedral High School in Hamilton, Ontario where in 1998 he was a OFSAA champion, and in 1999 an OFSAA silver medalist. Mihai was then selected to play on the Canadian Junior National Team in 1999. Mihai has served as a skill development coach for three teams in the NBL Canada, Mississauga Power, currently the Raptors 905, the London Lightning, and the Niagara River Lions. He has also worked with the Boston Celtics D-League affiliate Maine Red Claws for the past three seasons as a guest trainer. We just launched our Hoop Heads Pod webinar series with some of the top minds in the game across all levels, from grassroots to the NBA. If you're focused on improving your coaching and your team, we've got you covered. Visit hoopheadspod.com slash webinars to get registered. If you're enjoying the Hoop Heads Pod, please leave us a five-star rating and review on your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends in the coaching community about the show, and make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. Check out hoopheadspod.com where you can listen to every episode we've ever recorded and find out more about the mission that drives our show. Have a pen and paper in hand so you can take down some notes as you listen to this episode with Mihai Raducanu from No Limit Performance and Gannon Baker Basketball. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel. And tonight we are pleased to welcome to the podcast Mihai Raducanu. Mihai, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Unbelievable job with the name pronunciation. All right, that's all. We're always off to a good start. As we said before we jumped on, you never want to butcher a person's name uh, in the introduction. So I'm glad I passed that with flying colors, and now we can jump into you and your basketball journey. Let's start by going back to your childhood. You grew up in Romania. Talk a little bit about that, and then we'll eventually get to you and your family getting to Canada and getting you introduced to basketball. But let's go back in time to when you were a kid. Just talk to us a little bit about your childhood experiences. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in uh, I grew up in a communist country. Uh, it was communist until I was ten years old. Uh, I lived in a, in a city called Cluj Napoca in Romania, part of Transylvania, and uh, you know we, we grew up as as any other family would over there, struggling to find food, struggling to find money, struggling to feed ourselves. But uh, my both of my parents were athletes. Both of my parents, my dad was a track and field uh, guy, and my my mother played basketball. So. I tried both. When I was uh, about 12, I really started liking basketball. So um, I played for, in in Europe at the time, it was a a tier system for clubs. And I played on the youngest club team for uh, my city. And uh, 
that's how I started, man. I started playing and I became national champion at the age of 13. I still have a DVD on that. Nice. Uh, <laughs> got invited to uh, the tallest uh, players in the country camp. There's 10 tallest people in the country my age. And uh, we had an amazing training session in the mountains for a couple of weeks. And I learned a lot about myself. And um, yeah, one of my, the, the, the higher tier players, I guess, was Big George, seven foot seven, George Bodeshan. I'm sure you know who that is. Absolutely. Um, you know, he gave me a, a pair of shoes when I was young. <laughs> he was in a movie. I know him from a movie, man. He was That's the, him. What was, that, what was that movie that he was in? My Giant. Yes. That was yeah, a good with one. Billy Crystal, man. Him and Billy Crystal. Look at that. You got me at two minutes into the podcast. See, I man, see, right Miha, you're, Miha, you're doing something right, man. You got Jason to jump in really early tonight. Good it's work. That, it's that Eastern European uh, history. You That's know? it. That's it. But yeah, that was that was that's where my journey started. I mean, my mom just said, "Hey, you should play basketball," and I remember showing up, and you, you get right into right into it. And there's twelve other guys your age, and and they put a ball in your hand, and and you know they they put you through all kinds of training sessions, and and you either like it or you don't. There's no uh, there's no in between, right? What did you like about it? What did you like about basketball when you first get introduced to it? What was it about the game that struck you and said, "Hey, I want to keep doing this." Same thing I love about it today, and I'll be 40 next month. I'll be 40 years old, and uh, same thing I love about it today. I love being on the court with a bunch of like-minded guys that I know they have my back, and I absolutely love competing. I just love competing, but having four other guys on the court with me, and to this day, I still love it. What do you remember about some of the training methods when you went to that camp for the 10 tallest people in your age level what do you remember about some of the training that you did at that time? Well, we had, so that was 1993, and our coach was about 91 years old. This is not a joke. <laughs> That's not a joke. So the training methods were extremely outdated, but uh, they were hard. <laughs> we were uh, running up and down hills. We were uh, carrying each other up and down hills. We were puking. We were rolling down hills in our own puke. We were, it was just... It was just grueling. But interestingly enough, uh, I still talk to some of those guys to this day that were on that team that, that we had our backs. And it was really a team building. The guy was a, a Phil Phil Jackson type of guy before before his time. Interesting. And so when, you, when you're training with those guys and you're playing on this team, what does your season look like? Like how many games are you playing with that particular group? And what was the level of basketball like? If you could, I don't know, give us something to compare it to. What was that level of basketball like in Romania? Yeah, so for me, because we're so young, so we were the, the third team down. So there was a pro team, uh, the, the number one team that was playing. Then there was a group of guys right underneath them. They were kind of jumping back and forth between playing on the big court, we used to call it, and they would play. Uh, in different national tournaments or regional tournaments and national tournaments. And then for us, we're the young kids that were, they were just prepping. They were, they were trying to see who's going to be able to make it, who's got good bodies, who's, who's got good brain, who's got good potential, who's got good work ethic. And, um, I, we, we practiced, I mean, we practiced for five, six months, maybe play a couple of inner squad scrimmages. And then we'd go down to and play in a national tournament. Uh, you travel by train. And you go down, and, and we won it. We won it when I was 13, and it was a big deal for us. And then I got to dabble. I got to dabble with the, with the top team for a couple of games, and I'll never forget that. I'll never forget being in that locker room, showering with these seven-footers and, and playing my five minutes. And I remember having my first dunk. Uh, just just incredible. That's Those are my, my vivid memories. So how important was it for you in that time of your development to be able to play against older, more experienced players? I got to imagine that you can attribute a lot of your eventual success to kind of getting beat up and pushed around when you were younger by some of those older players. Yeah, that, that plays a lot into it. But I think the knowledge that they put on you, the way, the way you conduct yourself uh, pre-practice, the way you conduct yourself in practice, the way... Uh, the way they can push you on the court and the way they can be your, your friend and your brother off the court. Uh, those are the things that really made me, really, really made me like basketball and understand what it takes to, to be that good. They all worked their butts off. The guys, guys were sleeping with, you know, uh, ankle weights on their, on their legs just because they thought it would make them jump higher. And 
guys would would go and run the hills on their own and guys would get 500 shots up every single day and that's what you learn from the older guys the physicality yes uh them being that much better than you yes you learn and you admire all that and you aspire to be that good but at the end of the day um the the mental aspect of things and, and them showing you what a true professional should look like that's what really sticks with you what was the level of popularity of basketball in romania during that era that was, I mean, that was when George, they for George was kind of the first guy to leave, and he went to to France and he played for Portes over there. I don't know if you remember that far back, but he was he was the icon for us, and there was a couple other guys that left after, but um, yeah, it was it was probably the second sport. Soccer is always going to be number one over there, but uh, it was probably the second sport. But uh, fans were going out. There was horns, and then typical European, uh, you know, crowd watching the games. And I remember going to almost every home game, walking or taking the bus by myself when I was 10, 11, 12. What was the craziest fan story you remember from that time when you were going to games? Nothing seems crazy to me, right? Like from, <laughs> from flares and smoke and <laughs> horns and people fighting. I mean, that's it was just normal. So I don't think there's there's anything that really sticks out to me. But that that's just the norm in European gyms. Uh, they cleaned crazy. it up a bit now, obviously. But back yeah. then, it was just like a soccer match, right? That's crazy. It's kind of funny. <laughs> so, so then, obviously, when the communist regime in Romania falls and your family decides that you're going to immigrate to Canada, you get here when you're, I believe, age 15. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, I was 15. Okay. Just turned so, 15. So... Just describe for us what your feelings were like, just in general, in terms of leaving your home country, moving halfway across the world, getting here, not being able to speak English or speak the language or communicate. Just talk about what that was like as a 15-year-old kid, because we think about how any of us were at age 15 and just sort of how challenging that, ter that time of life can be for anybody. And here you're going through this tremendous life change and your whole entire life that you've known for uh, 15 years has been uprooted. Just talk a little bit about what that was like, just as a human being. Forget about the basketball side of it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, first of all, you guys don't know me that well, and <laughs> I'm always excited. I'm always excited to do things. I'm always excited to get challenged. Then the the, the lasting images in my head of leaving was uh, me and my family being packed, my mom, my dad, and my sister packing up on a train, uh, leaving the train station. My grandparents are, are, are out there. And my two grandmas, uh, actually only my two grandmas were out there watching us and some relatives and some, some people and everybody's crying and I'm smiling and I'm like, this is going to be cool. <laughs> we're going on, a, on an adventure, something new, something cool for us. And it's hard to explain, but everybody wants to get out of there. Right? Just just because the way life was, because the way we grew up with, with being oppressed with communism. And, um, you know, I remember leaving my grandfather, my mom's dad. I went to say goodbye and he was ill by then with some he had some some cancer issues and uh he was laying in bed and i went to say goodbye and he said hey take care of yourself take care of your sister do really good i'll never see you again and i said oh that's crazy you're gonna see me again but he goes no no just promise me right and uh two weeks after we got to canada he died and that that always stuck in my head and my mom couldn't go see it to to her own father's funeral because we we're just fresh in canada we we couldn't go and um you know those two things really stick in my head about leaving and then getting to canada not being able to speak the language uh being dropped off by uh somebody in, in a hotel in outside toronto on the outskirts of toronto and and, and four of us in a hotel room with three thousand uh, dollars to our name trying to figure it out uh, but we did <laughs> we we did and uh you know a, some luck came along the way uh, so some people that uh, my parents knew from romania uh we got a hold of them we had a phone number my mom called they said hey we're 45 minutes away from you why don't you come stay with us and it so happened that the next door neighbor was a basketball coach who, you know, my, my, my friends, they translated uh, that I like to play basketball. And the guy put me in contact with Coach Mark Walton. And Coach Mark Walton is the winningest high school coach ever in Canada. He is a basketball legend. 
and uh, I just basically landed in a, in a hotbed of <laughs> high school basketball with the greatest coach in the country, and and he just started developing me because I I wasn't developed at all, right? And well, sorry, not at all. I shouldn't say at all, but I wasn't ready. I didn't know. I didn't know what to expect. So that's that was the that was the journey to get to Canada. How tall were you when you got here? I was six six and one hundred and sixty five pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah. There you go. Yeah, well, yeah. Matt, you know, it's funny you hear that story and you just think about how that whole process could have gone and I think it starts with just your attitude and how you approached it and then you combine that with the good fortune of getting connected to coach Walton and and having that opportunity that who knows you could have ended up in a different city in a different place and and never found that basketball mentor that could have kind of guided you through the process talk a little bit about the challenges of not being able to speak the language when you first get here and just how you went about handling that both from a basketball and a school and just a a cultural perspective well, um, you know, I, I was in grade 10 when I came here. So I finished grade 9 in Romania and started grade 10 in Canada. And um, I, I registered to the high school and, and I went in and a guy who's one of my best friends to, to this day, <laughs> uh, his name is Mike Lawton. He, uh, he was in my gym class and he looked at me and he, he asked me to dunk the ball. And I was wearing dress shoes and uniform. It was a Catholic school uniform, and but I didn't know what he was saying. I didn't know what he wanted me to do. So he handed me the ball and pointed to the rim, and I just jumped straight off the ground in my dress shoes and my uniform and just hammered the ball. And that was just instant friendship. Say, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I like this guy. Yeah, yeah, instant friendship. And their junior team was really good. Junior team at the high school was really, really good. And, and Coach Walton was the senior team coach. And he grabbed me as a young immigrant, grabbed me and said, come play for me, I can teach you. And he asked me if I like basketball. And I said, I do, I really do. And he said, you know, do you want to be really good? And I said, I always want to be good. Like, But, you know, dictionary open, translating, it's crazy, the communication. <laughs> coach Walton will tell you to this day that when I called him, uh, he thought he was like a 75-year-old drunk man playing a trick on him <laughs> because I had uh, cause I had the dictionary I was translating as I was going. But, uh, yeah, that was it. And Coach Wong just said, hey, if you want to be good, you got to go 30 minutes before practice, stay 30 minutes after practice, and, and do what I say. And um, that's that's what I did. <laughs> that's that's I just love basketball. But I was lucky that our program was good. I was lucky that guys around me, uh, were were super competitive. Um, I was lucky that we hung out on and off the court, and and we ended up having an amazing high school career. What's your favorite memory from your time playing high school basketball? What sticks out? Maybe something on the court, something off the court, a game, relationship with a teammate. What what's your most vivid memories of being a high school player? Well, you know, um, people that didn't go to my high school, they don't understand our relationship, but. To this day, I communicate with about 70% of my teammates uh, on a weekly basis, some on a daily basis. And that all stems from Coach Wong building what he built for us. But we did everything together. My buddy Mike, who, who taught me how to speak English, his, his mom had a Suburban, and she'd pick all of us up for school. All of us. I mean, the whole team. She'd pick us up in the morning and take us to school. And... Then we'd go in packs to the YMCA and beat up on people on the weekend and, and on the court. And uh, we went. We ended up being 33-0 and in North America. We, we won everything. We had seven guys play NCAA basketball. Three of us were on the junior national team. And everybody else played university basketball except one guy who played 14 years professional football. <laughs> it's, that, that's, my, that's my favorite. That's awesome. That's it's not often that you get a chance to play with uh, such a, a great group of teammates at the high school level where so many guys are able to have that success. And again, it's just amazing when you think about your good fortune to be placed in that situation and just to be able to have that opportunity. And it makes me, and I'm sure you've thought about it before, and it makes me think about what if that 
hadn't, you know, that path hadn't opened for you. I get the sense from just talking to you in this brief amount of time that we've known each other here that even if you hadn't fallen into an ideal situation, I get the feeling that you would have found your way to an ideal situation somehow, some way, just because of the positive outlook that you have. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's, I do, I do some speaking. I know we're going to get into that later, but I always say opportunities, they come by all the time for everybody. And that means nothing. It's the outcome that really matters. And um, I knew that that was special and I felt that it was special. And um, the outcome from that, the friendships, the, the ability to get a secondary uh, post uh, education, the ability to play on the national team, the ability to, to, to have Coach Walton still there. You know, like I said, he, I talk to him every single week. My girlfriend works with him. He's a university head coach in Canada, a women's program. And my girlfriend's his assistant coach, so I get to I get to still get knowledge from him on a daily basis. So the outcome, I think, is the most important. Opportunities, they always come around, always for everybody. It's just what you do with them that matters. Yeah, so true. And I think it's also if you put yourself in position to take advantage of those opportunities by working hard and being open to those opportunities. So many people you see that those opportunities come in front of them and they don't always grab them because of whatever reason, some obstacle that's in front of them that you just can't see around or get over. And I think that your story indicates just like what we've been talking about, that if you can overcome those obstacles and you don't necessarily see them as things that are in your way, but just things that you need to get over, things that you need to learn from, and then you ultimately grab onto those opportunities. As you said, opportunities continue to come if you put yourself into the right position. And speaking of opportunities, you had an opportunity to eventually play college basketball. At what point did that start to come on your radar that, one, you wanted to play college basketball, and then, two, when did you come to the realization that, hey, this dream is going to be something that I'm going to be able to achieve? Well, it's funny because <laughs> it's funny you say that. My mind was never like that. It never thought about it that way. I didn't know. I had no idea. I remember I come from a European system. And right. And this was all foreign to me, and I didn't know about it. I just played basketball because I really, really love basketball. And I didn't play basketball for any other reason but to go out there and kick guys' butts and, and win and, and, and do what I love. And I remember sitting in a class in, in grade 11, and Coach Walton <laughs> came up to my class. He was he was also a guidance counselor, a, a, a co-op teacher, I guess, was at our school. And he came up and he gave me a letter and um, it was from a university. And I remember him saying to me, you have to open this, you have to read it. Uh, it's probably about just people wanting you to play basketball at, uh, at their school. And I said, cool. And I opened it, it was a super nice letter and everybody around the class was kind of looking and everybody knew what I opened. I had no idea what I opened. Well, it was a letter from Notre Dame University. And <laughs> I had no idea. And Coach Walton knew how I was and he understood the way I was, my mind was working. And he never really explained anything to me. He just let me be me. He just let me play. And, you know, kept handing me letters and letters and letters and ended up having 50 scholarship offers. And then I finally understood what that meant. And then um, I said, oh, wow. I can go to school for free just to play basketball. This is amazing. I'll do that. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. And so talk a little bit about how you ended up making your decision. You obviously reconnect with uh, or, or connect for the first time with, with Gannon Baker there at Coastal Carolina. But just talk a little bit about the recruiting process. Yeah, Pete Strickland was the head coach. Pete Strickland was our head coach. Gannon was the assistant. And and Pete Strickland recruited me when I was at uh, when he was at Dayton University, and I thought I was going to Dayton. I thought that was the place. I really liked Pete Strickland, and then Pete Strickland ended up getting the head job at Coastal Carolina, and then Gannon came up, and uh, there was five schools that I, I narrowed it down to. It was Coastal Carolina, Florida Atlantic, Boston University, University of Maine, and Furman, and. Um, those were my schools, and I went down to Coastal uh, on my official visit. Absolutely loved it, loved everything about it. Uh, loved the coaching staff, 
uh, Gannon's. You guys have spoken to Gannon. You've interviewed Gannon, so you understand his personality and how he is. So I totally loved that when I walked in the gym and this guy's jumping rope in the corner listening to Rocky. <laughs> and I said, I, I, I like this, right? And then right. Um, I went on one more visit to Florida Atlantic and I, I came back to Canada and I told Coach Walton, Coach, I like Coastal Carolina. I just want to go there. I don't want to go on any other visits. I don't want to. I don't want to do any. It was. It was getting really busy, Mike. Um, it was getting really busy. So I ended up signing early in November of my last year of high school. When you get there, when you get there eventually, okay. So you play out your last year of high school, and you make the transition from high school to college. Now you're going to another new country. So you're leaving Canada. Now you're coming to the United States. You're making the leap as a basketball player from high school to college, but you're also making the leap as a student and just as a regular human being from one environment to another. So just talk about what those adjustments were like or what you remember going from your senior year of high school into your freshman year of college. Um, there's a couple of things that stick out that, uh, I can talk about. And number one is when I got there, I was like, okay, well, I'm a top five player in Canada, possibly number one player in the country. Um, and I, and I go down there and it's going to be the same. I'm going to have five dunks a game and I play above the rim. Uh, everybody's going to throw me the ball and I'm going to keep on playing. I knew nothing. I've never seen an NCAA game before. I didn't, I didn't know anything <laughs> about it. <laughs> and I get there and I'm like, holy crap, everybody is better than me or just as good as me, you know? And then you get a quick, there was, there was seven of us, seven new guys, seven freshmen, and, and you know, a couple of guys our size, Anthony Shushnara, who's, who's one of my best friends, but we battled it out for five years. So it was, a, it was a true wake up call when I got there for the first pickup game, and I'm like, okay, everybody's better than me or everybody is just as good as me you have some work to do big fella and then i started my first game <laughs> in university and i ended up playing against george mason university who had a 27 year old uh post player i'm six nine so this guy was six eight strong but he's a 27 year old ex-marine and i remember he just sat on me drop step dun drop step dunked on me and said Welcome to the NCAA, young fella. <laughs> and I said, okay, now I got to get better. So that was on the court. But then off the court, uh, there was a senior named Matt Gladio who was walking with me through the hallway, kind of giving me the lay of the land. And he asked me a very crazy question that I still use in my development to this day. He said, five years ago, would you have ever thought that you would be in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, playing basketball? I said, no, five years ago, I was in Romania trying to find food. I, I never knew this existed. And that stuck with me, fellows, because reflection is incredible. So I've been doing that since I was 19 because of Matt Gladio. And I always stop and reflect and think and, and look back at where I come from. And it's just, it's an amazing practice that's helped me continue to grow. Well, I think it speaks to sometimes we get so caught up in the day-to-day -day of the things that we're trying to do. And that could be, again, as a basketball player, as a basketball coach, as a business person, and just in our lives in general with our families. And we get so caught up in that day-to-day -day that sometimes we underestimate what we're able to do over the course of, if you use that five-year period, like the quote that you just shared with us, I think sometimes we overestimate what we can get done in the day, but we underestimate what we can accomplish in five years. And I think your story that you just told of here I am in Romania, barely having enough to eat to now I'm playing basketball in the NCAA in a completely different country. It's just amazing that what can be accomplished if you just keep putting one foot in front of the other and have a positive attitude and keep looking for those opportunities like you described earlier. Yeah, I think I think it's so important to um, live in the now and live in the present and live 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 here because the past is irrelevant. It, it never matters. Uh, you can learn from it, but you should never look back because there's nothing you can do about it. 
and the future is not real, doesn't exist, but your actions today dictate your future. So that's, you know, being grounded in, in the now, in the present moment, and, and, and doing everything that you possibly uh, can do so you can get to somewhere <laughs> that you in your brain is, 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 is an accomplishment, is something that you want to do, something that you want to uh, leave a legacy for this for, for your lifetime, to make the world a better place. If you continuously focus on doing good things every single second of the day, then good things will always happen. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that that's something that everybody should keep in mind, and especially during the times that we're living through right now, it'd be easy to focus on some of the negative pieces of what we're all going through and we're all experiencing. And yet, I know that for myself, and I've talked to other people kind of in my circle, you kind of have to look at this time where we're all being forced to stay home. And Kenyani, you can use it in one of two ways. You can use it to be afraid, or you can use it to sort of go up into a shell and sit around and watch TV, or you can use it as an opportunity to grow and connect and try new things and read and try to grow. And I think that you know, you think about what you've done in your life and what you're trying to accomplish through all the different things that you have going on right now. And that sort of epitomizes basically your philosophy. And I think it dovetails really well with what we're trying to do here with the podcast is just, again, try to be someone who's a learning for ourselves, but also giving other people who are out there in our audience an opportunity to learn and, and, grow from some of the people that we've been able to have on like yourself to share your stories. And to me, that's just what is so powerful is you can look at two people can look at this exact same situation and one person can kind of let it shut them down. And another person can say, wow, this is such a great opportunity for me to try something new or learn something new or do something different or just continue to grow. And I think that that's the story that you've told to this point is just crystal clear that when we take advantage of opportunities, good things come our way. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Well said. I mean, it's the people that are struggling right now through this, through through whatever this 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 time in history is that we're going through, are the same people that um, are on the pilot. The same people that wake up five days a week and do the same thing, uh, that recharge on the weekend and do it again and. The studies have shown, I'm sure you guys you guys read a lot like I do, and most of them just don't want to do that, but they do it for the wrong reasons. And what happens, you, your, your life conditions decline, and you're responsible for it. So, and when you lose the ambition for your life, you lose ambition to help those around you. And when you lose ambition to help those around you, then what's the point in being around? Because we have one job, and our job is to make the world a better place but you got to be good with yourself and if you don't love yourself and you don't take care of your body and you don't take care of your mind then you can't do anything else for this world so you're just stuck on this autopilot of of earning a paycheck no matter what it looks like and and upholding some sort of life conditions that are trivial to what actually you're supposed to do on this planet yeah i love that philosophy and i think it's something that no matter what field you end up in. And obviously we're spending a lot of our time talking to coaches and our show is geared towards coaches. So I think this conversation clearly can apply to the why for a coach and, and why do you go out and what is it about coaching that you love? And if you're only concerned with wins and losses and what you can get out of it, then you're probably in it for the wrong reasons and you're probably going to burn out pretty quick. But if you're in it for the right reasons and you're in it to serve the players that are a part of your program, to serve the families of those players, to serve your assistant coaches if you're a head coach, to serve the people who are sort of the surrounding administrative people around your program. You're going to end up with a lot more life satisfaction regardless of what your one loss record is if you're focused on just trying to, as you said, make the world a better place. And you can even narrow that down even further to just to make the people who come in contact with you better for having known you and interacted with you. And to me, that's just a powerful statement in terms of a way to live. Uh, I'm glad you agree, man. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. It's great. It's great stuff. So let's apply that to your college basketball career and talk about, you, you know, you, you told the story of 
getting in there and realizing, oh man, I got to get better. So other than what you did within the confines of your team practices and the things that you quote were required to do, what were some of the other things that you did or that you felt you had to do in order to raise the level of your play up to where you wanted it to be? Well, I had to, I had to lift weights for the first time in my life. I've never lifted a weight, so I had to learn about that. I had to learn about the weight room. I had to learn about how am I going to play at six foot nine, one hundred and ninety five pounds? It's not going to happen. So uh, then I had to get into the weight room and learn about that. And, and thankfully, we had a great strength coach at the time, and and he taught me all that. And I and I put a bunch of a good weight on that that allowed me to still be athletic. And um, <laughs> you can't get much better than having Gannon Baker as your assistant coach. <laughs> <laughs> if you want somebody with energy that wants to get wants to wants to make you better, that that's a pretty good way to go. That guy wanted to work out with us more than we wanted to work out with him, right? So it was it was, it was such a such a perfect place to be. And and then Pete Strickland, who's you know learned from Morgan Wooten and I don't know if you know that whole Damatha tree but I mean, absolutely that's... we've had coach Jones who's at Damatha now we've had him as a guest on the show yeah, okay so you understand that whole yep, thing absolutely so, you know and Pete coach again and, and it's just I mean that those guys with skill training and, and the individual workouts you had no choice but to get better even if you didn't want to be there you still uh, you still got better so those were the things that uh, I did uh, when it came to my body and, and, and basketball, and I wish there was more knowledge back then about nutrition. I wish there was more more knowledge about uh, mindfulness and how to take care of your mind and meditation. But it just wasn't that time yet. Uh, but you know, I tried to bring to the team what what I learned in high school from Coach Wong, and that was always hanging out with the guys, always making sure we're together. If if we get in trouble, let's get in trouble together. If we if we go work out, let's go work out together. If we go eat, so we just rolled in packs around that campus, and it was. I guess that's why we still talk to this day. That's why to this day we still have group chats, and and to this day we still share uh happy moments and, and ask for advice and, and help each other out and, and and we built this this amazing camaraderie that nobody knows how many points you scored nobody knows how many rebounds you got nobody knows any of that but we know the man and we know the principles and we know the character and it's easy to reach out uh for anything to to my former teammate and nothing's changed in, in you know 20 years removed from that do you attribute that to you guys as players, as teammates, or do you attribute that to what the coaching staff was able to do to foster that, or was it a little bit of a combination of both? Yeah, I think it's a combination. I mean, Coach Strickland uh, was pretty clear about what type of players he was recruiting, and he always he wanted guys that can play, of course, but he was always a character first guy, always a character first guy. So he did a great job putting the package together bringing the right guys in, and then we obviously clicked. We obviously we were in the perfect environment. Um, and, yeah, I think it's a combination of both, Mike. All right, so you mentioned nutrition. You mentioned mindfulness. You mentioned that you wish there was more knowledge out there about some of those things. And when you said that, that took me back to the time when I was playing in college. And I have some of those same feelings that you just shared about nutrition and just the way that we went about things and how things were different. So just to give you a couple of examples, for us, we would always eat every single pregame meal. We would still eat steak every single pregame meal before we played. And I mean, I played in from 1988 to 92. And clearly by that point, there wasn't a whole lot of nutrition knowledge out there, but certainly it was known by that point that probably steak wasn't the best thing to eat and I was lucky I always had a stomach that I could play on pretty much anything except for pizza so it, <laughs> nice. ended up being, it ended up being okay for me but still you just think back to that you're like gosh how did we not you know how did the coaching staff not know that it's just kind of interesting Mike Mike lives on peanut butter and jelly so you know yeah okay. I live on pe I live on peanut butter and jelly now it's my lunch every day so it's been my lunch since the time I was like probably seven or eight years old that's what my mom <laughs> my, that's what my mom would pack for me every day and just never felt the need to to change it. And then the other thing when I was at school that we would do is, so we would practice uh, our, our, our practices, especially in the preseason, 
we would have our five days a week uh, during the during the during the school week, and then on Saturday morning we'd get up at seven a.m. and we'd have I don't know probably an hour and a half regular practice, and then we'd do like a two hour inner squad scrimmage, and then we'd have the rest of the day off, and then we'd have Sunday was our off day, and so we would immediately get done with this three and a half hour practice slash scrimmage on Saturday morning. So it'd be like 10.30 in the morning and we would go from showering the locker room. We would go straight to Ponderosa and <laughs> the old buffet. And we would just literally, I mean, that place had to lose so much money on the basketball team going and sitting in this Ponderosa and just eating just, I'm sure the worst, you know, I just think about the food we're eating and the oh, chicken yeah. wings. And I, I, you know, I was probably drink, drinking a half gallon of soda and all these different things. And it was just, you just didn't, I mean, you probably should have known better, but at that point there was nobody, there was no adults talking to you about those things. And it just kind of struck a chord with me when you were talking about wishing you had had that knowledge that players have access to and coaches have access to today that you didn't have access to and neither did I when I was playing. Oh, and it's, it's, it's incredible. And, and, you know, my partner, my girlfriend, she, she played division one basketball. She played at Fairfield and her third year, she was just immobilized. She was in bed. She couldn't get out of bed. Uh, she ended up being diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and there was nothing that they could do for her uh, except an injection. So after months and months of, of figuring out what it was, it was an injection. And then three years ago, she said, I don't want to take the injection anymore. And I said, well, what can we do? It was a two week inject. Every two weeks she had to inject. And we did research, and um, we've been three years now vegan, fully vegan, uh, fully natural products that we use. And guess what? She's two years medication-free, inflammation-free, pain-free, and she feels better than she did when she played in college. So diet fixed <laughs> uh, uh, autoimmune disease on her. And I'm 40, but I feel like I'm 18. And this is the times when I'm like, man, I wish I knew that when I was 19, 20, 21, but it just wasn't out there. The, the knowledge wasn't, wasn't there, you know, but, um, yeah, Mike, I agree. It's such a huge impact on an athlete to eat the right way and, and understand their body. I'm not saying vegan works for everybody. I'm not saying, uh, any diet works for anybody, but understanding your body, uh, will will give you a lot more than you do if you just go through the motions. Just like yeah, anything, though. Oh, absolutely. I think if you if you understand yourself and understand what it is that makes you function well, I think that is a huge part of it. It's interesting you being a vegan. My wife was not a vegetarian her entire life, but probably was a, started as a vegetarian in her I'd say early twenties. And so I have three kids, and all three of my kids have been vegetarian from the time they were born. Have never eaten any meat whatsoever the entire time that they've been alive. And I, I always tell people I am, I am not a vegetarian, but I'm a home vegetarian. So I don't eat any meat at home, which basically means that if I go out to eat once or twice a week, I'll, I might have a chicken sandwich or something like that. But certainly I feel like I eat much healthier than I did when I was younger. I grew up in a household where we had some kind of meat every single meal. It just was, that's just the way you ate. And, and I just think about now how much better, healthier, and I haven't been able to completely take the plunge. I probably should. My wife and my kids are always kind of on me that, you know, hey, dad, why you got to eat that chicken sandwich? But uh, Your choice, man. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just, but I do feel that their choices and my wife's choices, it's been interesting with my kids just to see them and, and just sort of how, again, healthy they are, how they feel, and then also it's interesting for them from a cultural standpoint when they go to school and kids obviously have questions and, you know, they're always like, you guys have never eaten any meat before and any, any of those things. And it's just, you can, you can now have a solid reason. It's interesting as my kids get older. So I have a junior in high school and a son who's going to be, uh, he's in eighth grade now, be in ninth grade next year. And just as they become more educated about sort of the, the health benefits and the environmental benefits of being vegetarian and just how that they're now, they're now able to answer questions that other people have for them about why it's, you know, why they do it. Just right. hope you don't end up at a Sabaro without cheese, right, Mike? There you go. That's true. That is, that, that, <laughs> that, that is true. That is, that is true. 
<laughs> Jason and I and my son, we drove out to Snow Valley Basketball School in Iowa. Okay. And so uh, when you're on the road and you're you're stopping at different places, you have, as you know, I'm sure, you have much more limited options in terms of the type of food that you can find. And so we were trying to find somewhere where my son could find some food on when we're on the road and we pulled into the Sabaro and they they didn't have any pizza that was just cheese pizza. They only had you know, they only had pepperoni or sausage. And so <laughs> so my son really didn't get to I don't even remember Jason what he ended up what we ended up getting for him and I'm pretty sure we got eat. chips at the the convenience store and he ate those. I'm pretty there sure that, that was what we did. The there real healthy go. that was really healthy. Yeah, yeah. So we're not, we're probably not, we're probably not on the same level, unfortunately, as as you are in terms of that that health, uh, you know, the healthy eating. But we do pre- we do pretty well at my house. Uh, yeah, I mean, everybody's got to do it their own way. Uh, you just got to understand it. You know, it's there's no, and by any means, I'm not a nutritionist, and I never. Everybody asks me questions about it, and I always say you got to figure out your body, just like you got to figure out your sleep. Everybody says, oh, uh, five a.m. club, five a.m. club. Well, hang on. We all have our own circadian rhythms. We all we all operate differently. There's four different kinds. Figure out which one works for you. You might be a late sleeper. Don't force it, right? So there's there's no formula that works for everybody. You just got to figure it out. No question. At what point during your playing career do you start to think that maybe some type of coaching might be in your future? Never did. Never did during my playing career, to be honest. Uh, I never thought about it. Um, I just, I, I ended, uh, I, I just I just finished playing uh, in 2004. I set out my third year because I got hurt um, and I redshirted. And then uh, I finished in 2004. Um, and I, I got married uh, very young at that age and uh, never really thought about coaching or, or playing. Uh, I, I dabbled a little bit into the, the professional um, leagues. My, my good friend Mike Taylor uh, was coaching in Germany at the time. Well, he wasn't a good friend then. He was a coach, but now he's become a good friend. And he offered me a place to go play for him in Germany, but I ended up breaking my ankle and, and that never panned out. And I just went into the working force and uh, yeah, I never thought about coaching and I can go into how I became a, a coach if you want me to. Or, Absolutely. Or, yeah. I mean, I, I moved back to Canada and um, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I had two degrees. I had a degree in business uh, marketing and a degree in business um, management. And in, when I lived in Myrtle Beach, I worked for, for Xerox. And I hated it. I hated the suit. I hated the tie. I hated, I hated the sales part of it. I just hated it all. And came back to Canada and Coach Walton to the rescue. He was retired and he said, hey, what are you doing? I said, I don't know. I don't know what I want to do. <laughs> and he said, you want me to teach you how to build decks and fences? And I said, yeah. I never built anything in my life. I want to learn. So he paid me for a whole summer. Uh, I was driving about 70 kilometers each day to meet him and work, and he was paying me 10 bucks an hour to learn. <laughs> and I was I was learning, I am learning, 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 and um, I, I I started my own deck and fence company. I started building decks and fences, and I was loving it. Uh, at some point in time, I said, "There's got to be more to this. There's got to be more to life than this." And in 2007, well, end of 2006, I was 26 years old. I guy I was playing basketball with said, hey, well, actually, you want to play with us in a tournament? I said, sure, I'll play. Didn't know any of the guys. Didn't know anybody on the team. And they all showed up. Half of them showed up to the Sunday game uh, in suits. And I said, oh, where are you guys coming from? Silly me. I'm asking if they're coming from church. And they said, no, no, we're, you don't know what team you're on? I said, no, I have no idea. This guy asked me to play, so I'm playing. I don't know. I, I don't know who you guys are. Oh, this is all cops. We're a police team. And I said, oh, cool. And they're like, do you want to be a cop? I go, well, I don't know where I come from. <laughs> no. Like, where, where, I, <laughs> where, where, where I grew up, no, I don't want to be a cop. They're, those are the bad guys. Those right. are the bad people. And anyway, I learned more about it, and I applied, and, and I got hired at 27 uh, to be a police officer. And 
once I got hired, a guy that I was, he was a police officer as well, said, hey, you played high-level basketball? I said, yeah. He goes, I have a kid in grade seven. Do you want to teach him? I said, sure. Yeah, I can teach him. So I showed up in his driveway. Uh, I had like, I did what I saw my coaches do. I, I wrote out a practice plan. I printed out the piece of paper. I had it by times, you know, the, the normal practice thing. I right. had it tucked in, folded, put in my shorts, half of it sticking out. <laughs> you guys yep. know the look. Oh, I know exactly the look. <laughs> Absolutely. I've been there. I've been there. Yeah. So I show up in this kid's driveway. Um, some some neighbors are trying to walk their dog across the driveway. I kick him off the driveway. This is our space. We're working out. And um, that's how it started. And the kid bought in. And the kid got better. And then his teammates wanted to get better. And then his team wanted to get better. And then I said, hang on. I don't know what I'm doing. I, I, I don't know. I can't do this. Like, I, I'm not not that good and i need somebody to to mentor me and that's when i called g bake again and i called again and i called g bake i called i called g bake and i said hey man i know you've been doing the, the shake and bake and you've been you've been doing your, your your thing for about four or five years i need some help this is what's happening here and he said i got you big fella send me a box of dvds <laughs> <laughs> and he said start studying this stuff start learning it start doing it, start applying it. And next thing led to another and it's 2012. I'm, I'm four years into this skill training. I'm still a cop. I'm a detective. I'm a, I become a detective. I become a, a street crime unit detective. And I just dealing with, I was taking people's drugs and kicking in their doors and taking their money and buying drugs and teaching young kids how to play basketball. And it got to the point where one of my mentors was a deputy chief of police at the time and we had lunch and he said listen you can't you can't do both it's not uh, it's not conducive to your lifestyle uh what if i told you that you can take a year off without pay go do the basketball thing and if you don't like it you have your job back if you like it you can make a decision i haven't looked back I took a buyout a year later. I retired from police work, and uh, off I went. And that's when I joined Gannon's. Um, you know, he had a he had a. It's the mentorship group that we have now, but he looked right. a bit different at the time. And and I joined uh, as part of his his whole team, and we had a great team of people. And I just kept getting better and better and better. And once I dedicated myself fully to, to learning every single day from 2008 to till now, I'm still learning every single day, um, good things happen. What did that learning process look like for you? So what were you doing to improve your craft as a coach? Was that, again, watching DVDs, watching game film of certain players, going out and going to clinics, working – personally one-on-one -on -one with Gannon or other coaches that were part of the group at the time? What did the improvement process look like for you? Yeah, 100%. I never believed in, in watching film. Uh, my high school coach was, uh, and he still is to this day, he coaches university and he's always, let's worry about what we do. Don't worry about the rest. He doesn't, he doesn't scout. He doesn't watch the other team. He just goes and beats on people because they do what they do. So I had to learn about that. But yeah, the the process was watching Gannon uh, demonstrate, and then you know calling Coach Strickland and calling Coach Walton, and then going to watch some local games of higher level, like universities. Um, you know, going to watch some Final Fours. Just starting to learn. Two thousand fourteen, I went to my first Final Four, and I've been hooked ever since. This is the first year I missed one, obviously, um, and. I went to follow again. I said, Gannon, where are you? What are you doing? I'm coming. So I would drive down to Ohio, drive down to Florida to take his coaching class. And I took his coaching class like three times. And, uh, you know, as, as the internet developed, taking online courses and watching people and um, doing it, actually doing it. And it turned into me just getting more knowledge that I can pass on to these players. And I wish that, the first players that I was training in 2008 had the brain that I have now because they would have been better off. But that was just the reality. I was just doing 
everything I could to get him better then, but I wasn't as knowledgeable as I am now. And I'm sure I'll look back to today, 10 years from now, and I'll say the same thing. Understood. All right, so that takes care of the basketball side of it. How did you go about learning and understanding and building the business side of your training? Because obviously the basketball is a part of it, but in order for you to make a living at it, you also have to be well-versed in the vis- the business side of it. So talk a little bit about how you developed that part of your coaching. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a growth it was a growth process. Uh, at first, like I told you, it was in a, in a driveway, and then uh, when more more kids, when winter time showed up, right in Canada, we get pretty bad winters, and then I said I got to go into the gym. And you didn't just, just shovel. <laughs> no, it's just people just do that for the Instagram, man. Come on. <laughs> no, it's just right, but that, that's how it starts, and um, I remember. S- having parking lot beers i'll never forget this after friday night men's league with my buddies we're having parking lot beers and i'm saying guys this is kids want to want to learn from me there's two three guys so i'm going to do more of this i want to do more i want to i want to help more kids and and they're like and you're going to charge them but they're all like basketball coaches teachers and i go yeah yeah i'm gonna charge they're like it's never going to work and nobody's going to pay for that so this is a huge lesson I give to people on fear because if I would have let that fear get into my mind and, and the doubt and say, you know what, these guys are right. They know. They're from the area. They know what's going on. They they understand uh, the, the game of basketball. And I could have just simply not done it. But I said, you know what, fellas, I'm going to do it anyway. So one of the guys was the athletic director at a local college. And uh, I said, hey, I got to get in here. And he said, well, you can't. I said, okay, well, let's look at the schedule. Anyway, one thing led to another. I was using the gym when nobody else was. I was buying the, the security guards, uh, you know, coffee gift cards for the Tim Hortons here. And uh, I would give them to them every week. <laughs> and they would let me in the gym. They thought I belonged. So I snuck in this gym for about two years uh, and worked out people, sending out emails. And then, you know, it progresses with business. I have a good business mind. And then you, you progress to online registration. In 2010, I created my own. Um, and then when I finished from police work, I said, well, I need a hub. I need a place. I happened to stumble upon this half-court gym that was in a, in a commercial building, a, a state-of-the-art facility, but just half-court. And I rented it. And I rented it for about four years. And that's where I grew everything. I mean, that's that's where I started getting influxes of people from different cities coming in, flying in from Europe uh, to train with me to stay for a month or two. Uh, it, it just became a hub, a hub of basketball for, for anybody, national team players, um, NBA players. It just became a real cool place to hang out. Uh, I, I, I hired and I partnered up with a strength and conditioning coach who also had a gym inside there with me. And and we were just hitting everybody. His his wife was a, a meditation guru. So when somebody would come in, we'd hit them with basketball, strength and conditioning, movement, and mindfulness. And it was the whole package. And it was absolutely, that's where the business started blooming. All right, two questions. One from the very beginning of when you started, and then one from the end. So let's go with the question at the beginning first. Am I talking too much, baby? Don't no, you are absolutely. Give you more pause. Or? No, you are absolutely not talking too much. They, people want to hear you. They don't want to hear me. They want to hear your story. They don't want to. Okay. They don't want to. They don't want to hear mine. So you're doing a great job. Thanks. Um, so my question, going back from the beginning of your business, was when you first decided, okay. Your friend asks you to work with, the, you know, with their kid, and all right, you're working with them, and then you get to the point where you're like, okay, this is a business. I'm going to start charging people. Did you, when you first started charging people, because this is something that I went through. I used to coach at the high school level, and then when I stopped coaching at the high school level, then I started doing some training. And I used to, when I first started, people would call me up and they'd say, hey, I want to train with you, and I. I'd kind of be like, well, you know, they'd be, how much does it cost? And I'd say, well, it's, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's fifty dollars an hour, and I would kind of feel almost guilty about it at the beginning, charging people. And then I quickly got over that within like a month or two, and I had so many people calling me. I'm like, look, if you don't want to pay 
what my going rate is, there's going to be somebody else who will. So did you kind of go through that same process or were you kind of just, or did you just go right from the start and understand that if I, this was going to be my livelihood, I had to charge and you just kind of went forward from there? Yeah. My grandpa, the grand, my grandpa that, that died after I left, um, he told me, if you offer anything for free to people in life, he was a great businessman. Uh, if you offer anything to people for free, then you have no value. Don't take anything for free ever because that person has no value. Why would they give anything for free? So from day one in 2008, August 31st, I'll never, I still have the first practice plan. I can send it to you. That's awesome. Um, I charged, I charged 30 bucks, 30 bucks an hour. And that kid, even when my rates went up to 60 bucks an hour, he was still paying 30 because that's the loyalty, you know, and then, uh, I charge from day one. I set the standard and I, I haven't stopped charging. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. All right. From the end or from the, the time at, once you had the business built and you were in your half court facility, how many hours a day were you on the floor training you know, per every day? How much, how much were you out there on the court working with kids? During the school year, I was on there. Kids would come in 5 a.m., 6 a.m., 7 a.m. Then they go to school. Then I would just work on myself, work on my body, uh, work on business side of things. And then they'd come back in. Some kids would come in at like 2.30, and I'd be there until 10. And then summertime, it was uh, 5 a.m. <laughs> until 10 p.m., nonstop workouts. And I loved it. I loved every minute of it. What's what's your favorite part of the training process? If you had to point to one thing that when that alarm goes off at four in the morning or four thirty in the morning, you know you're going to be at the gym at five a.m. What is it that just man it gets you, you? You can't wait to get out of bed to get in, and get to the gym and start working. Impact, just my ability to impact. That's one of my top five things in, in my life that I that I cherish, and I always I have five things that I. That I look at the ability to impact, the ability to, to go out there and help change this kid's game or help change this kid's uh, life, help change this kid's outlook on, on what they need to do, help them figure out what they're good at, help them figure out that, um, you know, maybe they're uh, a rebounder, maybe they're a hustle player, maybe they're a good screen setter, maybe they're a good passer. Uh, you know, telling them the truth and helping them find the truth and then helping them develop that. And then, of course, the impact on life uh, that I have through my life experiences. That's how my whole talking and leadership and mentorship stuff started on the court with kids. Some kids would come in and, you know, they, they, they sit there and talk for an hour. And sometimes the parents would sit there and talk to my kid. Uh, no basketball today. And that's, that's, that's why I do it. All right. So let's transition into that and talk a little bit about some of the things that you're doing that you're continuing to do today with the leadership and the character piece of it and you're speaking and then we can also get into what your role is and what you're still doing with with Gannon uh, in terms of being his manager of business development so maybe talk a little bit about each one of those things and then we can dive into them a little further yeah for sure I mean it, it's all the same wheelhouse uh, nothing's nothing's different it's all sports and, and impact and leadership and uh, my my leadership series started on the court and started with uh, me talking to kids and the kids, they, they, they were athletes and they coined them knee-high talks. And, you know, to this day, every day, there's, there's messages that I answer from all over the world with, with, with players that impact and they call them knee-high talks about their mindset and about approaching life and approaching uh, having this, 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 you know, the, the, what we talked about at the beginning, that opportunities are just that. And what are you going to do about it? How are you going to do it? And, and, and what are some actionable items? And everybody's got different things to deal with. And then um, different schools, because kids would go back and would write papers behind my, my role model. And then somebody would get a hold of it. And the print, next thing you know, the principal's calling me and say, hey, can you come speak to my school? And we want to hear your story. And at first, it was so, it was in its infancies that I would really just go and tell my story. And then I said, well, they, they can't do anything with my story. Like, this is, <laughs> it's just my story. There, there's no actionable items. There's no, they might be pumped up and they might jump through a wall for, for five minutes and then what happens after? Uh, so then I started developing my, 
my entire uh, you know talks and, and leadership to be to give these kids things that they can take and work on themselves things that they can hear my story hear my example and then they can go and apply so um, one thing led to another and you know now I'm doing <coughs> Uh, a program called Leadership Through Sport, which, uh, in conjunction with the with the Ministry of Education here and and Urban Priority High Schools, I'm doing it in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, and it's a program that's really it's for for students to foster that positive development uh, and, and their well being, and, and but challenging them and helping them acquire the right set of skills and experiences and, and relationships that. It enables them to develop into successful and contributing adults to our society. Because if you can't show them that they can all achieve some sort of level of excellence by learning and opening themselves up to a world that's currently unknown to them, maybe, uh, it's just going to foster. Like if you do that, it's going to just foster their well being and personal growth. And, and that's the focus with these leadership through sport. And, I do that for university programs. I do that, uh, you know, for, for some corporate uh, programs and it works. I mean, because it's 2020 and we don't, we don't have management anymore. Management doesn't work. Uh, single leadership doesn't work. It's, it's group leadership. Everybody has to, has to, has to lead together. And, and that's, that's my focus with, with those, with that type of, uh, you know, mission or I guess, side of the business if you want to call it all right i'm curious about your process for putting this whole thing together so when you talked about your knee high talks that you're having with players out on the court was were those things that were just in your mind and then as you started to put together leadership through sport did you have to for lack of a better word formalize and take those talks and put them into get them down on paper and put them into a coherent plan as part of your process. So did you go from something that was just in your mind that you could recall as you're talking to players and you're out on the court and you're just sharing your experiences. And then as you're putting together your speaking series and, and trying to have a greater impact, did you find that you had to go through those stories and kind of curate them and put them into a, a package that you could then be able to better share with the variety of different groups and kids that you're talking to, you know, through your ser through your speaker series that way. A hundred percent. And Mike, Jason, I, I didn't figure this out on my own. I'll, you know, I'll be the first one to always admit that um, it was just the talks. It was just off the top of the head. It was just uh, dealing and catering to that individual that was in front of me at the time. And then when I was going into a group setting and speaking to a group. Uh, it was engaging and it was good. And uh, then I said exactly what you just said. I need to be better. I need to get better. How the heck can I get better at this? I know which basketball coach to call, but I don't know what to do. And and I ended up uh, through mutual friends meeting a a, a business uh, development incredible awesome woman that's uh, you know she also. I can't really say what she does because this is a uh, it's kind of a conflict of interest for her. So I'm just going to leave that out. But she's she helps me and she came and she watched me speak and she watched me uh, deliver. And she I, I, I did a Ontario Youth Leadership Conference, which is, you know, 2,500 students. And she came and watched that. And and I, I rocked it. It was cheering. There was there was high fiving. And I'm like, how awesome was that? And she said, not so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, cool, thanks. And then she said, here's my notes, and this is what you got to do, and this is how you got to approach it. And from then, every time I, I went out and did a speech, she came and watched, and we filmed. It's like watching game film. And then you, you just you get better, and you, you organize it, and you categorize it. So now there's like a, it's a template almost of things that I want to touch on. So, you know, there's, you know, there's a theme. Uh, I always start with the top five things that you love about yourself, uh, that you love in your life. And then you move on uh, to, to knowledge, being free, and you, and you keep on moving down. But the, uh, the stories that I share and the facilitating questions to the group 
they always change based on the group that I'm speaking to. But I have my staple that I like to go through. I have my my eight very, very um, defined themes that are um, part of my my core, my character, my 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 entire personality, and my entire my principles of living life the way I do. So I always am able to relate back to those and develop my speeches from that. All right, let's go back to your five year rule from earlier. Would you have ever thought five years ago that you would be on the speaking circuit? No, never, never would I have thought that. Never, never, ever. It's cool that I think when you talk about public speaking, it's something that so many people in our society are afraid of. I know there's that famous, I don't know if it's a study or just quote or the thing that you hear that, you know, people are, people are more afraid of death uh, than, than they are. Or people are more afraid of public speaking than, <laughs> than they are of dying in some cases if you get these statistics. And it's always been one of those things that's amazing to me. And I think as as a coach or someone who's a teacher, you know, your entire life is spent talking in front of people. And whether that's a group of kids on the basketball court or whether that's a group of kids in a classroom. And so I always think that one of the things that I've always enjoyed is the ability to get out and, and talk to people, whether that's on the basketball floor, or I've done some workshops for the Positive Coaching Alliance. And I think one of the things that is really powerful about being able to speak in front of large groups is the impact that you described earlier of being able to work with, let's say a player one-on-one -on -one or a small group of basketball players, but then you can take through speaking and be able to multiply that impact in front of a large group. And if you really work on your process, like it sounds like you've been able to do and really hone it down to where you can be a skilled public speaker. To me, it's such a valuable skill. And it's not just a valuable skill if you want to be a public speaker as a profession or as a job. or It's just such a valuable skill, I think, if we could teach all kids to be able to be comfortable speaking in front of a group, our world would be a much better place. I agree. I agree. I fully agree. And I don't, um, I haven't pushed, I haven't marketed, I haven't done anything that's come for to me uh anything that's come out of the, the leadership and the mentorship speaking it's just come to me i haven't sought it out because i'm really focused since 2000 it's february 2017 i'm just focused on helping gannon uh you know reshape his business and get to where we are today with it and and that takes up a lot of, of my time and a lot of my energy and it's 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 such a such an awesome thing to do to be able to to work with my one of my mentors and who's become one of my best friends and and we have so much fun doing it and we do it in a completely different way than any you know books write about the way we 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 do things and um it's that's taken up probably you know 85 to 95 percent of my time on, on a on a on a monthly basis but you know the speaking just comes they just you know you get an email you get a call you get somebody hey i heard about you can you come in and and they're okay because they, they take an hour they take a couple hours out of your day and, and you go and you impact and you have a positive impact on the athletes or the students or the the under um, urban priority kids or whoever it is and uh, it's fun to do that's great stuff. Let's talk about what you're doing for Gannon in terms of your role. What are you doing day to day? And then talk a little bit about the vision of what the two of you guys are trying to do in order to reshape his business and have that greater impact that I know is important to you and clearly is important to Gannon as well. Yeah, I mean, we uh, it, it's the vision is simple. The vision is to mentor and lead coaches and, and provide value to any coach out there in the world. It doesn't matter if they're a, a grassroots coach, it doesn't matter if they're a high school coach, an AAU coach, a university coach, an NBA coach. The mission is to provide value, mentorship, and, and anything that they can use to be a better coach. And and that's been the mission. When I, when I took over, we sat down and I said, well, okay, well, why do you want me here? Uh, you know, if you're my mentor, you're, you're <laughs> I'm supposed to learn from you, 
but Gannon realized, as, as any great leaders uh, realize, he, he knew that business wasn't his strong suit, and he knew me well enough to know that it's mine. And um, when we sat down in, in Florida, and, and he flew me and my girlfriend down, and we, we sat there, and uh, I agreed. I said, I got to take over fully for at least a year. I got I to strip you of any decision making. I got I got I got <laughs> I got to learn uh, everything that that goes into your business and and, and let's, let's shape it up and and we've done a great job. I mean, we have everything centered around the curriculum. And I don't want to repeat anything that Gannon told you on the podcast, so stop me if I if I get too 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 deep into it, but it's it's a curriculum and we created a systematic online a comprehensive curriculum, it's 1,200 videos that we split up into into various sections, various level. If you've never played ball or have never coached ball and you have zero experience, you can start at the first video, and you can go as high as you can develop. Uh, you know, hopefully, you know you can get to the, the the pro 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 high level, but the reality is most don't. So it's it's focused around uh, developing the way we filmed it. We filmed it with a double teaching method, meaning that the Gannon demonstrates. Then he, as he demonstrates, he teaches the coach how to instruct. And then he has live players that are appropriate skill set for the drill and uh, the part of the curriculum that they belong in. So that's, that's the main product. And then after that, at each level, you can obtain a certification. So we have a Gannon Baker certification now. First three levels can be obtained online. The master level, you got to spend some time with Gannon, either live in Florida or through some uh, Zoom calls, video calls with him. Uh, and we have a free mentorship program, which we, we launched about uh, eight to 10 months ago. And that's grown. We have a thousand coaches in there and there's resources for them. We're revamping that whole portal uh, so we can offer better information, searchable information, and that's happening right now as we speak, actually. And and that's where uh, we have Zoom calls monthly. Right now it's weekly because of the situation we're in and, and people are looking forward to it. And uh, obviously, Gannon still does on-court training for players. Gannon, you know, we still still have players fly in to, uh, to train with him and, and also... Throughout all this, uh, I was able to, to help Gannon and open up a company in China. And, um, you know, we Gannon found these partners in China and I brokered the deal. And I went, me and my girlfriend went to Beijing and we lived there for two months to, to get this company started and get it going. And, and now we have a coaching education company in China. So, um, you know, I was able to, to, to put his put his basketball vision into a real actual business instead of trading time for money. Actually in a business, it's always solve a problem. And the problem is coaches need resources, coaches need information, coaches need mentorship, and they need all of this in an organized manner. And that's what we've done. All right. So what I want to know is on the video side of it, how long is the process for putting together that entire curriculum from the moment that the idea is hatched and you start putting together what it's going to look like and the videos? How long is that process? What does it look like in terms of the time commitment and what you guys put into it? If you have a good team like we do, a year. It took us a whole year. It took us a whole year from the moment that we we mentioned the word curriculum. Uh, and don't forget, Gannon had an existing book. Like he had a curriculum, you know, that he put together over the years. So um, from the time we said, hey, it's got to be like this. Otherwise, it's just you might as well just have a, another YouTube channel, another Instagram account. We just throw random drills up. It's got to be like this. This is the research that we've done. And it's got to end up looking like this. And Gannon was huge on making sure that it reads like a book. You know, introduction, boom, boom, boom. It all makes sense. And uh, we we started putting it together. It took us about a month to put the whole curriculum on paper. It took us 10 days, 16-hour days. This is not a joke. 10 days, 16-hour days to film it. 
And but thankfully we have, I believe, the greatest video guy in the world. A kid I used to train, a kid that <laughs> uh I mentor in his in his business, a kid that's he's a young kid and, and he's just done a great job with his business. I actually talked him into dropping out of university so he can continue his his dream and he's done that and he's, he's really successful. But um and then editing and then finding the right medium to 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 host it on that's user friendly and then and then creating that channel and then obviously putting the marketing behind it and everything it took a whole year a, a whole year to do that yeah i can relate to that i did a, a a much smaller scale version of what you guys did and filmed i don't know probably probably filmed maybe 120 videos 130 videos of different drills and things and just it took it took a long time uh to do it both from a, a filming standpoint and then as you said from an editing standpoint and then trying to figure out what format you put it into so that it was easily consumable and so i can completely understand you guys i'm sure did it bigger and better and had all those things together much more than what i did i did that on a much smaller scale but i, I can definitely relate to what I'm sure you guys went through in terms of the preparation and just the effort that it took to put all that stuff together. And I know I've had a chance to look at some of Gannon's stuff that's part of the curriculum. And for coaches that are out there, if you're looking for a great resource for ways to, whether you're a high school coach and you're trying to work on your the player development side of your program or you're a trainer out there that just wants to be able to learn from one of the best and probably – the original basketball trainer out there. I think you you definitely want to take a look at what Mihai and Gannon have put together because it's it's really good. Uh, it's really good stuff that that can help you to grow as a coach or if you're a player and you want to get it and, and work on work on the skills and, and be able to work with Gannon virtually. I think it's a great way to be able to do that. And as we've referenced a few times here, the enthusiasm that Gannon brings to anything that he does, he he might be the most enthusiastic person that i've ever had on the podcast just everything that he touches he's enthusiastic about and i think that comes across in anything he does i i fully agree i think thank you for saying all that and, and yeah that's and we're not done i mean we're just we're just getting started in the product or he's continuously producing more stuff under under our guidance and our team's grown we have a big team of 10 people that that's working together and uh, Gannon, uh, I make my job right now is to, to make sure that that Gannon uh, does not probably for the past, I'd say year, a good year. Uh, my constant words to him are just keep doing what you're doing. Don't go rogue. Just keep listening <laughs> to me. <laughs> and and uh, he's he's a genius. I've never seen anybody. Uh, no basketball the way he does so uh you know we're doing research and we're, we're we know what people want what coaches want and what coaches are after and um yes basketball is great and yes we don't do x and o's and we don't do those things but uh what you get from from the curriculum and every product that we're creating right now for grant gannon is uh just life changing for the coach or material for you to grab and change your players' lives and and that's that's what we do and the way we do it I, I gotta tell you guys it's we always joke but you talked about the energy and you talked about what he brings and and you hear how I am. This is how I am. This is how I talk. This is I'm very even and I'm very I'm very calculated. I, I think things through and and that's just why we match. But you know, we're in two different countries. Sometimes he's in China Sometimes I'm here. Sometimes I'm in Europe. I started a camp in Europe uh, with with a bunch of friends of mine uh, in Lithuania in 2014. So sometimes I'm there. Sometimes uh, it doesn't matter where we are, but we communicate via voice notes like nobody else, and and we get things done. And you know why we get things done is because we both have attention to detail because we always are able to tell each other the truth. Uh, we're always able to get on each other, but there's no feelings involved. We're always able to hold each other accountable uh, and admit to things that we we might be you know stepping on a line for. And the one thing that you know, if this is advice for coaches or advice for skilled trainers or advice for anybody that's listening, if you have any type of 
business and you know running a high school team it's essentially a business uh you have to stick to your vision and <laughs> we've done that really really well stuck to our vision and mission statement every single day and our routine produces our results and that's one thing i learned from Jane as a player when i was 19 years old and it still holds true to this day uh, your routine will produce results. If you want to produce anything of value, you have to be cons consistent in your self-discipline. You have to be uh, consistently uh, taking care of your body and your mind to stay sharp, wise, healthy, passionate, energetic, you know, strong. Everything that goes into, into anything that you do. If you don't do that, uh, nothing is going to be worth doing. Everything you do is not going to be as good as it can be and it's going to expire sooner or later so true all right i want to finish up by asking you one question i don't know if you can or can't share anything that you guys are currently in the process of developing is there anything on the horizon that you can share with us with us something that uh, we can look for that's going to be coming out soon or is it is it too early in the development stages no, no, no. We we can share with you. Indeed, yeah, we can share. We have a we have a master class that's coming up in about I'd say ten days, May eight. I don't know when how many days away is that, but we have a big master class coming up. Um, and uh, from that master class, again, it's holding for the coaches. Uh, we're gonna have three amazing products, and one of them is dealing with uh, how to how to motivate a player, how to break down a player's strengths, weaknesses, how to make him or her understand what those are by watching their favorite player maybe, and then how you create a workout regimen for that player to succeed in your program. So that's one thing we're creating and it's gonna be awesome. Uh, the second thing is gonna be dealing with the emotional piece of the game which you guys you both know it's it, it's huge and anybody that's listening if you're not paying attention to that and you think that dribbling through cones and you know getting shots up it's all it takes uh you're wrong <laughs> so no we're, doubt. Uh, we're we're developing uh again it's uh, work hard um i can't tell you who's involved but there's two guys that you would love to see on there they're, they're gonna be awesome um and they actually are, the content's already done our video crew is just putting it together so that's that's the second product and then the third product is because of the times that we're in right now is a at-home uh workout and again it goes from you know the way you, you you know the john wooden how you put your shoes on kind of thing uh how you start a workout and, and how you build your workout and, and things that you can do at home in your driveway with the hoop without a hoop how you can take care of your, 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 your workout routine and still get better because the biggest thing that's happening, I'm sure you see it and I'm sure you hear it and I'm sure you, you, you run into it in, in your travels is, your digital travels, uh, is players are not getting better right now because they're doing, you know, group Zoom classes and they're doing all everybody's going to become a ball handling expert after this, <laughs> this, this this virus is gone and um coaches are voicing that so so we wanted to put something out there that actually helps a player be better actually put something out that a coach can help a player get better virtually uh and also something for the players and coaches to deal uh, approach the emotional side of things now, I'm sure that's going to be incredibly valuable because I think as we sit here today, we're recording on April 29th, none of us have any idea how long this is going to be. And it seems like it could be a lot longer than any of us are certainly hoping for. And so it's important for players to be able to have opportunities to continue to grow and improve and for coaches to be able to have things that they can share with players to help their players get better and to continue their program to as you said, give kids an opportunity to improve and get better. And so I know based on the quality of what the products and things that you guys have out there now that I'm sure all three of those things that you mentioned are going to be incredibly valuable for coaches. I want to wrap up, Mihai, by just giving you a chance to share how people can connect directly with you, how they can find out more about what you just described with Gannon, 
And then if there's any final point that you want to make before we finish, you can go ahead and do that. And then I'll jump back in and wrap up the episode. Yeah, thank you. I mean, this is, this is great. This is, uh, you know, you guys are true professionals, so I appreciate you guys having me on. But uh, if you want to get a hold of me, it's, it's very easy. Uh, you know, uh, my phone number, you can text 905-651-5086. Uh, you can email me, mihai at gannonbakerbasketball.com, M-I-H-A-I at gannonbakerbasketball.com. Uh, I have Instagram. I have social media. If you type in my name, Mihai Raducanu, uh, you, you, I mean, there's no others around, so just you'll find me. And, uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm open to anybody reaching out. Uh, I'm open to, to giving advice on, on anything that you find that I can help you with. And, um, Everything about Gannon and everything that we're doing with 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 the with the coaching mentorship and with the curriculum and development is just uh, GannonBakerBasketball dot com. Lots of information on there for you. And again, you can just email me and ask me any more questions that you have. And and, and that's basically it. But listen, before you wrap it up, Mike, Jason, I I really appreciate you guys having me on. I really appreciate the opportunity to to, to spread my my story and hopefully it impacts somebody along the way and if, if it impacts one person or, or one aspect of this helps somebody uh we've done our job and and you guys are have been true professional thank you for communicating everything clearly to me and and keep doing what you're doing fellas well thank you for the kind words we really do appreciate it we feel like we've had so much fun and, and worked very hard to try to put these things together and, and make the podcast hopefully valuable to have the same kind of impact like you described. That's what we hope the podcast is has done from the beginning and continues to do as our audience grows. And again, I can't thank you enough personally for jumping on and spending almost an hour and 30 minutes with us tonight. It's been a pleasure getting to know you, getting to know a little bit more about your philosophy, getting to know a little bit about the role that you play and Gannon's business and helping him to be successful with what you guys are trying to build together. And I really, really do appreciate your time. I don't take it lightly. The fact that people who have been our guests, including yourself, that they take time out of their schedule to share not only with us, but also with our audience here on the Hoop Heads podcast. So thank you. And to everyone out there who's listening, we really appreciate it. And we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Coaches, we've teamed up with Coach Tyler Whitcomb so you can now purchase his exclusive new playbooks right from the Hoop Heads Pod website. If you're looking for ways to improve your team next season, these playbooks blend affordability with the quality content that serious coaches are looking for. Just visit hoopheadspod.com store and you'll find playbooks from John Calipari of Kentucky, Leonard Hamilton from Florida State, and Mike Young of Virginia Tech. Check out these great resources at hoopheadspod.com slash store. Hey everyone, last year at the Junior NBA Summit, I came across an amazing company called iSport360 and its founder, Ian Goldberg. Their youth sports app gets coaches, players, and parents on the same page. Your team can set goals, share player feedback, training videos, sticker rewards, player evals, and practice assignments. All of this to foster a healthy team communication and culture. If your team or club struggles to keep open lines of communication, especially among team parents, iSport360 can help. If you want to empower your athletes to have more success, more confidence, and more communication with their teammates, give iSport360 a try today. Shoot me an email, mike at hoopheadspod.com, or give me a call at 216-392-4059 to learn more. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast, presented by Head Start Basketball.